Connell, and I am a book. Oh, I'm not a bookseller. I'm an event staffer here at Politics and Prose Bookstore, where, as you can see, we now are hosting in-person event events, books, trips, and classes. You can find everything that we offer on our website at politics-prose.com. So, before we get started today, I would like to ask that you please silence your cell phones so as to not disrupt the event. Um, and then when we get to the portion of our conversation for questions, um, we do have a microphone set up here to the left of the pillar that's designated for audience questions. We do ask that you come up and speak into the microphone just so the recording does get captured in our audio and video recording of today's uh, conversation. Following the Q&A, we will have a signing up here at this table. So if you have not already purchased the book, we do have many copies available behind the register for purchase. And once the event is complete, we do ask that you please fold up your chairs and lean them against something sturdy to help our staff out a little bit. So without further ado, tonight I am very excited to welcome Gina Rosero to celebrate the release of her memoir, Horse Barbie, a radiant testimony from an icon who sits at the center of transgender history and activism. It is a celebratory and universal story of survival, love, and pure joy. Born and raised in the Philippines, Gina is an award-winning producer, director, model, public speaker, trans rights advocate, and television host, and, and was named one of Gold House's 2020 A100 Most Impactful Asians and Pacific Islanders. Her directional debut, Caretakers, on PBS, a docuseries about Filipinos and care work, received four Emmy nominations. In conversation tonight with Rosero will be Aditi Hardiker. Hardiker received Rather, Hardiker serves as the Treasury Department's Deputy Chief of Staff. She has most recently served as the leadership and training lead for Bi the Biden-Harris transition, and prior to that spent three years at the Obama Foundation, first as the Chief of Staff, then as the Acting Vice President for Operations. So please join me in welcoming tonight to Politics and Prose, Gina Rosero and Aditi Hardiker. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Oh. Hello, here we are. Hello. <laughs> they should have um, included in your intro um, how we first met, which is when you casually gave a speech and introduced President Obama at the DNC LGBT gala back in New York in 2014. And they should have added that you're one of my favorite dance partners. Yes. So <laughs> we're adding that now. So thank you so much for adding that. <laughs> Um, Gina, I'm so excited and honored to be in conversation with you today. So excited to be here with so many family members, friends, neighbors, um, and just fans of yours, because I know there are many around the world. Um, I'm especially excited to talk about this book um, because, um, you know, just as, just as um, Katie said before this, this book really is about survival and it's also a celebration of life, it's a celebration of your life. Um, it's a celebration of trans identity and life um, throughout the world. I personally laughed, cried, cheered. I was hungry constantly with all the talk of Filipino food. Um, and really, it just, I think the story embodies what uh, the- I did not pay her to say that, okay. <laughs> you, I think, did promise to cook for me, which- I, yeah. did, I did promise to cook, um, yes, of course. <laughs> that I could attest, because I love <laughs> But the story, I think, really embodies the Monica Roberts quote that you used at the end of the book, which is, this is truly a, a passing of the torch, um, really giving the next generation kind of a, a blueprint almost and um, really spreading your, your trademark optimism. So thank you so much. Thanks to everyone for being here. And, and let's get started, unless you've got anything else you want to start with. One thing I'd say, just truly want to acknowledge, and I've shared it to a couple of people here, just to be here at Politics and Prose, um, even when I was writing this book during the during the pandemic, I used to watch their you know their talks, their book talks, and wow, to be here and, and speaking about this. So I really, I've been feeling such deep gratitude. So thank you again for doing this with me. Well, thank you. So let's start with the title, Horse Barbie. So in the book, you tell us a bit about the journey. Um, of this name, I think first it was from some jealous girls who were trying to use it as an epithet, um, but then your trans mother, Tiger Lily, and you kind of reshaped it into Horse Barbie, which um, really embodied the charisma, the, the fashion, the style. And I think as you um, uh, talk about in your journey, it then becomes really a source of strength. It's kind of the way you activate your superpowers. Um, you do everything from demand a job in Seven World Trade Center. You with um, no appointment, with no appointment, <laughs> with no, no appointment. appointment. Show up, 
um, you take the Miss Gay Universe crown, um, and you know you're you're here today. So talk to us about how Horse Barbie still shows up in your life. Um, how do you still kind of draw on her queer horsey magic and and continue yes, that forward? On queer horsey magic. That's direct quote from the book. So direct definitely. Quote. Um, so Horse Barbie is, it's as you said, it's a reclamation. Um, when, by the way, I'm still called Horse Barbie by my trans mother, Tiger Lily. I'm sure she's probably going to watch this later, Tiger Lily. Hi, somewhere there. And um, when I started joining trans beauty pageants in, in the Philippines at 15 years old, I you know, was still in high school and somehow I, I reached the top so quick. I became the most famous transgender beauty queen, the most prominent, the pageant diva, you know, all of that. And I mean, you know, if you don't know, I mean, you'll know when you read this book for sure, more and more, this vibrant culture of transgender beauty pageant in, in the Philippines, and it still very much exists today. You could just imagine how competitive it is, um, not just, uh, when I started joining pageant, when I started winning, I, I came out of nowhere. I remember on my, on my very first pageant, it was, um, I was still in high school, and my first pageant, I ended up winning second runner of Best in Simpson and Best in Long Gown. And then a week before that, I was just watching these girls on this televised, nationally uh, televised beauty pageant in, 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 in the finals. And then a week later, I was in competition with them, and I beat them out. <laughs> so you could imagine what that was like, you know, as this newcomer who came out of nowhere. It, you know, it was actually an insult. You know, it was it was a slur. It was an insult. So they started calling me like, "Oh, where's that horse girl?" Like I look like a horse because they said because of my protruding side profile, my long neck, my dark skin, and the wig that I that I had. So every time I would go in pageants, um, you know, I, backstage, I would hear it, and it, it was an insult. And then one night, my pageant manager, my trans mother, Tiger Lily, I mean, you can't be more magical than Tiger Lily name, so she definitely, I was on stage uh, wearing my iconic red halter gown, and just r remember her telling me like the way the light was hitting my, my gown, my the elegance that I was carrying, and the way I projected, she identified this almost this unspeakable essence and aura. And she told me, you know what, you actually look like a horse Barbie. So my trans mom gave me this name and you alluded to it. And it's, it's, also, it's a reclamation and also a spirit because as you know, and once you read the book, it's, uh, this book has been described as this global saga. And it's, it's the kind of spirit that I had to carry with me, especially when I moved to New York City, when I had to, I went from this vibrant trans beauty queen to going stealth in New York City. And I also just want to point out that the, when we were making the, the, the cover for the book, I remembered that my trans mom, Tiger Lily, does calligraphy. So this is her handwriting. So for her to have given me that name, for her to have a play and uh, uh, you know a role in, I, I do have a video and I'm gonna post it sometime soon on my IG. But you know, it's, it was she was so sweet to do this. That's wonderful. Um, so speaking of pageants, um, as you still tell me to this day, you're a pageant girl. Um, I mean the shoes, right? <laughs> <laughs> it never stops. <laughs> never stop. We don't want it to. I don't want it to stop. I'm <laughs> never gonna stop for sure. So um, you talk a lot about the history of, of trans pageants in the Philippines, and you talk about this unique cultural blend, I think you called it, where you've got families going straight from mass to back to their homes and their living rooms watching uh, trans girls on their TVs as a family um, with, I think, the same fervor as like Sunday night football here in the US. Um, I was even shocked pleasantly to see that politicians use the trans pageant stage to talk about their campaigns and truly it's 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 a it's a cultural and national um really uh phenomenon it's an informal I think. national sport in the philippines <laughs> exactly amazing it really is like that. so talk to us about um you know there was this really a, a, a tacit acceptance of trans women you got to grow up seeing girls like you women like you the manila girls so what what did that actually mean to you to to see people who looked like you and just have a different kind of s sense of self and, and a possibility for you? 
um, I want to offer even more complicated, um, you know, nuanced sort of, uh, you know, in my attempt to create a full, full picture about that. So, as you've mentioned, even even more so, like we have um, the trans pageants in the Philippines happens. So we have obviously, uh, uh, Philippines is predominantly a Catholic culture, very conservative. Still, the only country in the world where you can't get divorced. And then when we celebrate um, fiesta celebration where we honor you know, Catholic saints and patrons throughout the year, actually you know, during the month of May, it's usually actually my busiest time. It was, it, the, the month of May in the Philippines is actually peak Catholic fiesta celebration, which means you know, throughout the year, all over the Philippines, we have fiestas. And during those fiesta celebrations, it's, um, it's usually a five-day celebration, parties, you know, people's homes will be open up, you know, there's different programming. The main event that usually falls on a Sunday, the main event, the main draw of the crowd is transgender beauty pageants that coexist wow. within religious celebration. And usually, if it's a neighborhood pageant, meaning it's like put on by the, the local uh, community, that stage of the trans beauty pageants, it's usually in front of the church, right? Incredible. So you have that vibrancy of that culture. So for me growing up, to see that, I, I remember, I think this was edited out in the book, but certainly I remember um, the very first time I saw the, the trans, I was about eight years old, and it was in our neighborhood, and it was just one of those just the purity of, of that moment where, you know, the whole neighborhood, my childhood friends, we were going to watch these pageants, and the very first time I saw this beautiful, and in, in our pageant culture, you have to impersonate a different celebrity, and this woman was impersonating Phoebe Cates. And she looks like, you, if it, I'm dating myself here too, but like, <laughs> whatever, you know? Asian or racing, you know? <laughs> um, so she looks like Phoebe Cates. She, I was like in front of the stage and just in awe, uh, seeing her for the very first time. And it, it was, I distinctly remember how it felt, that sense of, as you said, possibility, but more so for me, just, just that sense of almost like this dream making that whatever that she's projecting on stage, how beautiful she is, obviously I was eight years old, but I just felt so connected to that expression. So to have that at such an early age, surrounded by my family, during religious celebration, there was no, even that, there's no such a feeling of, in a way, separation of, of that. It just, it just felt like it, it was meant to happen and likely allowed you to feel pride rather than what a lot of young queer and trans people feel, which is shame, that they don't see themselves, that maybe their religiosity is, is you know, not accepting or it's different from their identity. So that's, that's, pretty, yeah. that's pretty special. Yeah. But then you um, decide to go meet your mother in the United States where you can be a woman, where you can actually have your you know, identification reflect who you actually are, but on the flip side, you had to be stealth. You had to be Wabu King. Did I get so that to that right? Wabu King. Wabu King basically means unclockable. So it's it's also you know, the loving term amongst trans Filipinas, especially like you know when you recognize someone femme. Oh, you could pass. You're Wabu King. You know. I mean, we joke about it, but it's also survival. But it's also like a recognition rec recognition of each other's beauty, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you go from you know being with your family, being surrounded by trans people in in the Philippines, and you know having the celebration of your identity, to then going to a country where legally you're you're a woman, but in in theory in in society there's such present danger. You know you hear about violence. You have to be you have to hold this the secret, and that takes a really big mental cost on you throughout your career as you're trying to find love, as you're trying to be vulnerable with people. Um, so talk a little bit about how, you know, going from one culture to the next and living with the secret and constantly in fear, what, what did that do to you mentally and emotionally? I think I now know the question when I was writing this book is really, in a way, I think it's my it's it's a form of 
just really trying to figure out really what happened in my life. You know, in, in my time when I was in New York City, when I had to go stealth, meaning, you know, my model agent did not know I was trans, where I had to hide my, my, my trans identity to everybody. You know, I, I'd like to describe that, like in the Philippines, as what we've talked about, because I, I, maybe in, in, in this conversation, as I'm having you know talks and interviews with people, I always, you know, make that distinction of you know from where I was growing up in the Philippines to Western societies, because it's such a vast difference. Sure. And in the Philippines, as I've covered in the book, and we talked about, like trans people are culturally visible, like we're part of mainstream society but we're not politically recognized, meaning there are no rights for trans uh, gender recognition policies in the Philippines still to this day. And I just want to acknowledge the, the long history of activism in the Philippines, vibrant activism, very fierce activism in the Philippines that have been trying to pass affirmative laws. Like to this day, um, there's no comprehensive anti-discrimination protection. To this, as, in as much as there's so many changes, it's still very much DIY for a trans community to, to access gender-affirming care. I'm not advocating for that, but certainly in, in, in the context where you have to survive and you have to do it, you have to rely to, you know, with, with each other. So in the Philippines, as I mentioned, culturally visible, mainstream, but not politically recognized. So when I moved to America at 17 years old in San Francisco, when my mom told me that here you could be legally recognized as a woman, it was like she was speaking magic to me. It was like, what? You mean uh, legally on my F? Like I see F on my ID? That's just the impossibility of that. It was just, couldn't believe. And yeah, of course I moved to America. And then at 17 in San Francisco, I remember seeing you know my driver's license, California driver's license with an F with like such just intense celebration to see that and to feel that affirmation but then my first asked my mom, so where are the trans pageants here? And they're like, no, no, no such thing. And it's like, here's an application in a nursing school, you know, which is what mom would do, and that that's what she knows, and that's that's what she knows to get me to safety t in, in my life, you know? And obviously it was not for me. And I started to question why, and then I remember the very first trans representation that I saw on national television, 17 years old, right, trying to grapple with this new culture. I was watching this this channel, this this program, and trans women on, on this television program of Jerry Springer. So you can imagine what it did to me. I mean, like you mentioned shame, that was like really like it sunk deep. And I was just like, this, this is, I mean now obviously I have a little bit more of that, critical analysis of like what that meant, but certainly in that moment when I saw that, it was just the feeling of deep sense of shame, of, of transness and, and gender fluidity and, and anything that does not, and also not just like the, the initial recognition, but the way it was done. I mean, we all know, right? I mean, how it was done, right? The way, I mean, he recently passed, I remember when that news came out, there's a lot of conversations online about um, trans people that was um, that got on the Jer Jerry Springer show. I also understand that in that moment, that was the only way we could really affirm ourselves and and find our place of expression. They also got paid to do that, and so it's obviously complicated too. It's always about understanding which gaze are we putting importance, right? And um, I again, I completely understand that too. But yeah, that was the beginning of, of, of shame and, and thinking that I thought America promised me freedom. It gave me shame. Right, and, and on those shows, they were making it a sport to try to figure out who is trans and then you know, the whole audience would be you know, making a mockery or booing and so. You it's, know, just, it's the way they, and not just Jerry Springer, there's many other shows, right? I mean, I could name so many things, but the way they would butter up the situation right. you know, and then the drop. You know, and, and now in this context, as I'm, what I've written in this book is really, I'd say this, ooh, give me goosebumps just like realizing this. Um, I think it represented truly how America sees trans people from that moment, even today, in general sense, right? If it's nothing, if, if, the, if the vision and understanding of gender 
outside of the context of a straight white man who is holding the mic, who's the host of the show, who's the executive producer, the one in control, if it's not within that context of what that person considers norm, you, you are the butt of jokes, you are, you are you made fun of, you are the circus, you are, you are all of that rooted in shame. Oof. Um, well, as you were adjusting to your new life in the US and you, know, you were you know, starting to, to build your career as a model, um, as a music video girl for John Legend, um, <laughs> as you were kind of navigating. Let, let me also <laughs> say, like, this was just posted and it's like, I haven't heard back, you know, about what, I, I do know some of, you know, we, we have quite mutual friends, so <laughs> I haven't heard back, but certainly it was to, you could watch this music video now, it's called Number One, this music video, John Legend just started, and it was getting Grammy buzz, and it, that album won uh, R&B album of the year. And it was, I was part of this music video where, I mean, I started the book with this because I think it encapsulates so much of what I was going through, which is. And the lyrics too. Oh my God. Coincidentally or not. This book has a lot of coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> call it meant to be, call it a divine, divine intervention. intervention, all of that. There is so much of that. So in this music video that I did, it was, it was my, my, one of my first big jobs when I first moved to New York City in, in the pursuit of my career in fashion. I mean, my reference at the time when I took that job, because we all remember Naomi Campbell and the, the music video Freedom to all of that. I thought that's what I'm having, you know? It's like, oh, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna be famous in music video, the next level of career. But then I got on set and just the way it was shot, the way my scene was, I was dancing behind a curtain. I was a silhouette and then I was dancing to John Legend. And then when he, when he started singing to me, the 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 words and the lyrics that he was singing to me, I mean, it was meant for a book. I mean, it was meant for like a scene setting for a book. He was basically singing to me, the lyrics was, now who is she? What's her name? You don't need to know about everything. When I look back, when I was obviously writing this book and I, I you know, went to YouTube watch, I was like, gagging <laughs> literally gagging obviously i've forgotten about like what i knew the song but i forgot like that was actually what was being you know uh, he was singing to me with with that lyric so that was my introduction to new york city in fashion so yeah but also I, w what i want to add to that is in as much as it was terrifying to 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 manage all these different sort of realities right i was you know, I, I was very sexy in that music video. I was wearing a lingerie. You know, I was paid to do that. It, managing, trying to figure out not to get clocked, you know. Still want to be a wobble king, you know, in that as a form of survival. But also, there's the other side. It was also a sense of playfulness, a sense of, through that, while those things were happening, of that fear and paranoia and, and anguish, a mental anguish of having to hide, I was also, there's a part of me, I'm feeling sexy here, you know, I'm John Legend, up and coming, great buzz. You know, I was playful. So all of those complicated was happening. Lots Doesn't make it easy, but that was, that was what was happening. Well, I'm glad you still managed to find joy. Um, and so throughout your, your journey, you got, um, you got more in touch with your, your spiritual side, your ancestral side, which ended up being a, a big part of your journey. You learned about, more about, you know, discovering your ancestors, you learned about pre-colonial gender fluidity and, and spiritual healers. Um, tell us about how that, that really guided and shaped um, your coming out and what that meant for, for you understanding yourself. Thank you. Uh, you know, it hasn't been, I guess depending on, on who I'm speaking to in the audience, certainly it hasn't been covered, so thank you for, for bringing that up. Um, I have this tattoo here. It, this is a pre-colonial script in the Philippines. Um, this is um, called, it's a four character, La Kapati. La Kapati is a transgender fluid um, goddess of fertility, of harvest in the Philippines. So in pre-colonial Philippines, you know, we, we pray to our animus, you know, um, goddesses and deities, right? So it's a, it's a, so that's one, and there's so many. And for me, part of, there's many things in the book, but certainly that's actually one of the most 
powerful through line in the book, which is like this, this quest to decolonize my understanding of my upbringing, my culture, um, to, to deconstruct how I was brought up because I'd, I'd, I'd say this, it's fortunately or unfortunately depending, but certainly I had to leave the motherland for me to truly get to know the motherland. Because I, you know, I, I grew up in a poor working class background. I didn't go to college. I didn't go to University of the Philippines that had that wealth of resources of, of scholars. I never had that. So I had to, when I left the Philippines and even just the beginning of under, understanding what colorism is and how I was brought up in the Philippines, that was actually the beginning of it. And once I went on that quest, I, I'm unstoppable. Um, I like to think that I'm a closet anthropologist. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there, was a, there was a moment in my life where my IG handle is called Nat Gina. <laughs> and then when they rebranded that thing, okay, I'm switching. You know, I was like, no. <laughs> so yeah, there was a moment my, my IG handle is called Nat Gina because I really felt like that was both also a, a sense of adventure, but also a sense of quest in, 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 my, in my soul to unearth all of that. And from the books that I was reading, you know, I, I have to say thank you. And, and the epigraph of my book, I start with um, a quote by um, Dr. J. Neil Garcia, the foremost scholar of queer um, history and, and studies in, in, in the all, of, all of Asia. You know, which it's one of the first person that documented, you know, the, the long history of the Babaylan, which is the spiritual healers in the Philippines, the gender nonconformity and how that is well documented in, in, in our history books. And to unearth that and to have that, for me, it made it easier in that sense. It's a source of power, it's a source of it's a source of also fire in me to still unearth this and, 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 and find that in me. Yeah, and I, I love that you said you had to decolonize your identity. You know, I think there's, there's so many Asian histories. Um, you know, my, my background is South Asian and there's such a rich gender fluidity in our history, um, sexual fluidity, even to this day, but I think that's almost like a missing piece for us in how we actually understand ourselves. So the fact that you were able to really connect yourself to your roots, it was always in you. It wasn't something that was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm Catholic, and, but, and I'm, I'm trans, and maybe those things are okay, and, but, but actually you've realized that those things have always been linked. It's always been linked. You know, I was having a conversation with someone who you know, another person that, that 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 was talking about like this, an older Filipino woman that kept on saying he, she all the time. Like, I, I'd say this when I first moved to America, I would always say say he, she, you know, and, and everything because, I mean, even I mean, even that became a source of shame because people used to shame you. Like, no, you have to make sure that you say the right pronoun. And what I know now, through this uh, quest of 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 decolonizing my mind. Most Filipinos, especially if you're born and raised in the Philippines, you always be he, she in so many ways. Not intentionally misgendering someone. It's just because we don't have he or she in our language. It's a gender neutral language. And Tagalog, as one of, you know, is a main, dial a main language, but we have hundred something dialects in the Philippines. Tagalog is part of, this is the anthropology in me. <laughs> Add it to the resume. Oh, let's do it, let's do it. Um, so Tagalog is part of this one of, you know, the third biggest uh, language uh, family called Austronesian language family. It's spoken by close to 500 million people. There's about 1,200 languages that covers the vastness of Taiwan to Philippines to in 15,000 islands in Indonesia to Polynesia, all the way to Hawaii, Rapa Nui, Aotearoa, New Zealand, all the way to Madagascar. People there look like me and speak like me in that connection of language, right? And most of those language family are gender neutral, right? So to go back to when I was feeling shame because I was always mistake he, she, I still do, give me a couple of tequilas, I will definitely he, she, you. <laughs> it's progress. Yeah, yeah. Um, I like to say now that it's my ancestors telling me that we've always known. That's my ancestors' way of telling me to s stick to the ancestral knowledge. It's really beautiful. Your ancestors were anti-gender policers. I mean, just <laughs> go for it, right? I was like, just, just do it, you know? Forget about what people say, so, yeah. 
So I, I certainly want to get to audience questions. And just as a reminder, um, I think we can start probably in just a minute. Um, if you have a question, please come up to the mic. Since we're live streamed, we want to make sure people can hear. Um, so if folks want to start lining up, we can start the, the audience conversation. But maybe I'll, I'll do one last thing. Um, you know, we've, we've talked about, and the New York Times has talked about, and a million others um, who are singing your praises, that this book really is a celebration of life and survival and love. Um, but I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the bleak moment we're in. Um, one of the most beautiful parts about your story is really the love of your mother and how she encouraged you to come to the US, change your gender marker to represent your true self, take you to Thailand to get gender affirming care, um, and really just supported you with love. Um, at least that's how you, you showed us throughout the story. Um, but now what we're seeing across our country is, you know, parents like your mom who want their kids to get the right medical care that they deserve and that's appropriate to them are in some states um, being investigated for child abuse. We've got kids all over the country who aren't able to get, um, who aren't able to see doctors and, and get the right care for them. We're seeing adults being restricted, whether it's through Medicaid or other restrictions. Um, and so, you know, I think your, your story gives us such a source of hope, and I think it, you know, it is a, a model and a blueprint for so many, but talk to, us how, uh, talk to us about the role that your story plays in this fight against the assault on our people, the assault on our lives, our livelihoods, our well-being. Um, I think when we met in 2014, there is that there is that big wave of, uh, we thought that's obviously that opening up to that conversation. There was, you know. There is an however, and I think the however is that for so long, I mean, I also again, the context of um, American culture here, we're so obsessed with visibility, right? Just be visible, come out, and things will be okay. You know, just be visible. And I'm not, Denying that fact, that's an important component of, of this bigger conversation of, of justice and equality, but that's just one part, you know. From my story that I've shared in, in the Philippines, we are so visible. We are, pol we are, you know, culturally visible in the most mainstream sense, but we're not politically recognized. And in a way, I take that journey in my story to where we are now. We now know that visibility is not the only answer. It should be both, right? It should be that dynamic conversation of visibility, the most basic access to care, to you know, you know, nuance, dignified how we talk about uh, trans people. So it has to be all of those things. But more, more so, I think, with the things that we're seeing right now, I also grew up in the Philippines where everything is all about the community. Mm. And I'm talking about community, not also not from American sense of community, well, let's gather a newsletter, get together once a month, you know, like, again, there's an Read important us. role to that, you know, but also, Drag us. it's, it, but it's the non-Western way of communal sense, where it's really embedded in your spirit, you know, we have this, I'm so proudly that I get to actually now even talk widely about this, in the Philippines, we have this thing called kapwa, Right, which is this word, this virtue that is all basically what it means. Your inner self is always shared with others, and you're always a reflection of a community. Your very essence is community. You don't exist as an individual. So when I moved to America and I heard this thing called individualism, I was like, what? One person only gets a credit, you know. <laughs> One, you're supposed to do it by yourself. So that was that was a weird thing for me. It was also a shock, and I'd like to think maybe that, that sense of non-Western way of understanding of community is one answer, which is we now know wh whether it's uh, policies that are not really embedded in the Constitution, it still could be taken away. We could only rely to our community, right? In all essence of, of who, whatever that definition is community for you. And that community m could be like 100 people, 50 people, it could be just one or two people, right? And we need to rely with each other. So in reference to what you're saying, this book that I've written and uh, the response and 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 especially love hearing from um, parents that have trans kids. What I wanted to show in this book is the, the fullness of, of my journey. And I think I want to recognize and honor the lived experiences of trans youth, particularly trans people in general, that 
we have to live our truth despite all of that, and maybe it's, that's easier said than done, but certainly, if you could just dim that, that, that negativity that we, that we see in all forms of media and policies, that's one way is to still remember the power in living your absolute truth in all essence of it. Because I, with what I know now, with the journey that I've gone through, I truly, I truly honestly think that when you, when you look in the bigger picture, the powers that be who, and I'm speaking about patriarchy, I'm speaking about white patriarchy, they're afraid of looking within themselves the freedom that trans people offers, which is for so long we've been led to believe that this gender of binary, that gender binary, that is a form of rigidity, that is a form of limit, limit, limitation, that is a form of, you know, it's me against the world, you know, it's individualism. I want the parents of trans kids to know, trans kids particularly, that they're trying to take away our power because we know that we are powerful. We've been, we've been, the resilience and 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 the the stories that I that I've uncovered, that the stories that I shared, is this long history of beauty and resilience of trans gender nonconformity from the very beginning of time. I'm still talking about. I have a tattoo. You know, like it's 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 there. You know, we have to access and honor that history because we have made it. Again, I'm not saying it's, it makes it easier, but just to know that, because I could easily tell you, like, this is the next thing to do, but I think I'm even more concerned about the spiritual essence that drives someone to get to the next day. Because whether that, that belief of that power of trans people that leads to self-belief, I certainly know the self-belief in what, who I am got me survival and thriving and joy. So hopefully it would lead to that to other people too. Wow. Gina, thank you so, so much. Um, thank you. Um, we, we have time for some audience questions. Don't be shy. Um, the microphone is right over here behind this pillar. It's kind of hidden, but it's right up here <laughs> next to our good friend Ben. I'm a pageant girl. Give me the question. <laughs> Okay, hi. Hi. I have a two-part question. One is the easy answer. Um, do you remember meeting a sociologist named Danny Pila at the Filipino National Conference like eight-ish years ago? And she was like, I have a brother who's trans, and you recorded a video with her. And you said, hi, Nad. Oh I God. love you. You are beautiful. <laughs> It's okay if the answer is no. I don't remember. But, That's fine. but one thing I'd say though, when, when I'm being asked about that, especially in moments of recognition, to give that gift, I do it. Yeah. Because I know how powerful it is. And that's why I'm here today. I, I was like, I, I, I don't even, the universe was like Aww. randomly, like Gina Rosero just showed up on my Google. I was like, oh my gosh, she's going to be in politics and prose. I'm going. Like, thank so, you so I, no, here. no, thank you. Like, you have done so much work. And What's your name? Nat, N A T. Thank you, Nat. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so my actual long question is, because um, you know, obviously you. Sorry, I'm getting really emotional. <laughs> it's okay. Um, it's okay. I know that you, you know, were spending a lot of time with trans women communities back in the Philippines, because I also immigrated here. Um, but. You know, I'm, I'm trans masculine, I'm a trans man, and it's so hard for to see that, and especially I think in Asian communities, it's almost like we're kind of, I mean, just queer communities, period. Like, people forget that Asians exist, it's kind of annoying, because like, we're here, we're literally like the largest continent, anyways. Um, <laughs> it's not an anyway, it's a fact, so yeah. to speak Liter on it. Really. Um, I was just wondering, like, your, the whole time throughout your journey, like, how long, did it take for you to even see a trans masculine person and especially someone who's Asian even within the states because like I know even amongst my white trans masculine friends same thing they're like I didn't know anybody else I was on it on my own so thank you thank you thank you for for asking that question and sharing you know you know parts of who you are you know when I had the chance to go back to the Philippines and do some advocacy work there 
I have to be completely honest, same thing. Like I, that was my first time, you know, meeting the community. And because it, it, whether it's consciously like erasure or, or, or it's just, it's not part within my periphery, but certainly when I was there, it was a very, very vibrant trans masculine activism in yes. the Philippines. My friend Neil uh, Nodalo is the president of Trans Man and they're doing incredible work there. So That's awesome. if you, want to connect with them they're they're there they're doing incredible work there and i think you know i think in, in the in the recent times i mean I'm, I'm speaking about when i was there doing a lot of work around 2014 2015 they've been at it you know they've been at it and and so far because of that very fierce and vibrant ben is very much aware of this it's 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 become very inclusive i'd say that you know because it's Again, going back to the communal thing, you know, it's it's very much once people recognize like this is our brothers, yeah. we have to be there. So that I could speak about certainly in um, in um, in the Philippines, but here as well. Like I, it was a conscious thing for me because even in 2014, I, I you know after that TED talk, I was thrust into that conversation. So even that just be completely for perfectly honest like it was the beginning for me as well but the vibrancy is there yeah oh, yeah thank you for sharing thank thanks you. for being here thank you Nat. hi, hi. It's so nice to meet you it's nice such an honor to, to have you here i'm going back to your point about your ted talk could you kind of take us back to what that moment was like for you and also i believe you you know you you were like nine years in the industry with people not knowing that you were trans. Would you be able to kind of just briefly speak on what sparked for you to come out when it, you know, wasn't, you know, you weren't outed. So um, was it something that you knew that you were just going to have to do at some point? Or was it just something that you just had to live your authentic life? Thank you. Um, I wish there's an easier, <laughs> you know, trying to figure out ways to figuring out, okay, I need to do this. There's many, many moments. Sir, I detailed a lot in the book that led to that. There's many different, you know, inklings of possibility, inklings of, oh, maybe, oh, but I have to like step back because I also want to recognize the trans woman community in fashion is littered with stories of 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 stories when their stories were taken away from them. You know, it's littered with stories of trans women. I, I detail in the book, Carolyn Cosi, um, you know, Tracy Africa Norman, the first black trans model, in, big model in, in, in the 70s, to Lauren Foster, to um, um, Crimsona Kayser, a trans Filipina from Guam supermodel in, in Europe. Their stories were taken from them, meaning they got outed by a tabloid, and unfortunately, it's usually by someone they know, mm -hmm. whether off the cuff or intentionally selling the story. So in a way, to your point, this, this immense gratitude that I feel that I get to, you know, take control of my narrative because so many women were not given that chance. Um, and I, whether well, there's some sense of uh, knowing that there's a responsibility in telling this story. That's why I, I, I made a conscious choice that this story is unapologetic. Unapologetic me, unapologetic my truth of my culture, mm -hmm. because so many never had that chance. So I wanna comment on that. Um, but also in, in knowing that when I knew I was gonna come out, I didn't know. I never thought I would be able to come out. You know, I moved to New York in 2005. The first, the very first inkling of possibility where I could come out was I did the, not I could come out, but knowing that I cannot continue living this way. I did a, I did a uh, commercial, a lip gloss commercial. And as a fashion model at the time, it still is, but certainly at the time, when you do a commercial in cosmetics, mm -hmm. that's a pinnacle of success. Mm -hmm. You've made it, right? And a moment that should have been a celebration, I was, at, I mean, my commercial came out, I was at home freaking out that that phone will ring that someone from one of the tabloids saying that like, hey, Gina, we found out you're a boy. So for eight years living this paranoia, living this, 
this this anguish of any moment somebody could out me took its toll, I, and I couldn't continue anymore. And then there's many more. I mean, it's um, I think the, the 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 latest one that really took me to the edge. I got really, 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 really sick um, mentally. It was in a dark place, and at the same and and it, and it it came out in a form of um, crazy eczema. Eczema that came from the stress. I know now from stress. It, it was an you know it was an episode of eczema that that I never thought I'll be able to show my skin again. There's still some marks. Like it got to my head. It was it was so bad, and it took a, a female dermatologist to because I, I, I you know for months and months and months, you know they gave me everything that they could give like all the steroids, all the injections. Nothing was working, and then the woman just said, "What is going on?" Emotionally. I didn't. I didn't come out to her, but certainly I know exactly what she was talking about. And 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 no, it was. I was also turning thirty years old, mm -hmm. so it was that entering a new decade in my life and thinking I cannot continue living this way. And then there's many many things, and 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 the book that led to that. I think you know some of those stories now, but certainly those are the two big points on in in moments where I knew I cannot continue living this way. Thank you so much. Your courage and bravery will inspire so many and, and already do. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and that chapter is the sea turtle chapter. Yeah, I have the tattoo. You know, I had the tattoo. Ah. So in this moment, we're just going to say, if you know, you know. You'll come back to me. Maybe message me on Instagram DM once you get to that chapter. Because it's really, I mean, it's oh my gosh, I, this reaction, like, I hope, hopefully you'll say, oh my gosh, but like certainly get to that chapter. It's, this book has so much, so much coincidence, so much cosmic coincidence. And when you get to that sea turtle chapter, message me on IG and say like, Gina? I'm there. Not Gina, well, not Gina, no, <laughs> not, not Gina anymore. So yes, uh, just, just me, Gina or Sarah. But yeah, it's, it's, I think that's one of the definite pivotal point, uh, p pivotal point as well. Um, any other questions from the audience? Thank you to the two of you for your questions. Yeah, please. Hi. I can't believe I'm in politics and pros. <laughs> me, me neither. Thank you. I cannot believe this. Oh, thank you, politics and pros. <laughs> Let me just say hi to someone that's watching right now because I'm you. I think that's my camera. I was at home when I was, you know, watching a lot of politics and pros, thinking that oh maybe I could do that. I could be there, be here in this iconic space. I'm here, so if you're dreaming about that, it definitely could happen, so keep writing, keep writing. <laughs> Give it up. <laughs> <laughs> keep writing, keep writing. Hi, Gina, Hi. my name is Amelia, Filipina, Filipina uh, American here, and very Hi. proud to be Pinay. Yes. Um, first of all, I wanted to say, whenever we cry, you know, just go ahead and do it, because what I learned, I, I'm an educator here um, in Washington, D.C., but I'm also a proud Pinay American educator, and I speak all around the country, but when I learned about tears, I learned that it's our ancestors actually flowing through our body like medicine, mm. so never apologize speak, for those speak. tears. Um, so I've had the pleasure of going to the Philippines many times growing up, even though I was born here, and have seen uh, the gay and trans pageants. Yes. <laughs> and if you have a chance to go to the Philippines, you have to go. Oh, we're see. the most. Oh. We're, we're, we're just but the most. you have to go, especially if you could go during Fiesta Catholic celebration in the neighborhood, and it was like a neighborhood pageant. There is nothing like it. No. Oh, I just to go. I the to summer. Go to, yeah. Yes? Yeah. After the book tour, after the book tour. After the book tour. <laughs> after Deal. The book tour. So I remember having a conversation with my parents um, uh, about these pageants. And, and I was young. I can't remember how old I was. I was definitely a child. And I said, you know, it seems to me in the Philippines, there's a lot of pride. There's a lot of celebration around um, you know, the gay community and being able to do this and just going all out with the makeup, the dresses, the hair, everything. And, you know, one of my parents just said, you know, no, you know, it, it, yeah, it can be, but also there's shame there, there's shame. So I want to put yourself in that conversation. Just imagine yourself, you were there with me and my parents having this conversation. How would you respond to both of us, like my parent and me? Okay, we're also imagining they're really, really like family friends already, right? So yes. I'm going to keep it real. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I think there's a lot of trauma that we haven't fully unpacked as a culture. As I, I've mentioned, unfortunately I had to leave the motherland for me to truly get to know it. You know, it's still very much a very colonial understanding of our upbringings in the Philippines. It's still upholding you know, anything proximity to whiteness, the bleaching industry. It's still very much considered it's just is. Mm -hmm. But the moment when things are is just is, especially if it relates to these deeper questions about our history, our, our ancestors, it should be unpacked. And I think that's one way I'd say that it's like we need to really be decolonizing our understanding about this, unpacking all of that, and where we are in relation to our understanding of it. Because I came to it in, in I came to it, you know, from a different sense. You know, I'm sure you will, and maybe you have, and mm -hmm. anybody to you to find that place of entry in that conversation. But I think if I'm there because we're family, I'm gonna say, you know, we have a lot of trauma, <laughs> and we haven't truly unpacked yeah. what colonization has done to our mental state. And I think that's the, that's a, the deep, 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 difficult uh, task. To have, you know, how do you do that? How do you even do that? Mm -hmm. I mean, one could easily just say, "Oh, just have conversation." Yes, that's one, but it's the un uncomfortable conversation, you know. And I'm gonna say this as well. Like my my mom, who detailed in the book, as you know, if you read the book, my mom is the hero of my story. She loves me. She's a devout Catholic woman who loves her trans daughter, but I can't question her Bible. You know, and for so long, maybe I would, I would always going to be pushed back on that. Generational, it just is, you know. I, I would take the love for sure, you know, rather than having the argument. But my mom loves me. She was just at my book party, Dancing to Dancing Queen. And the next day, she thought, like, I felt like I was a celebrity. Everybody was talking to me. So I was so sweet. So that's my long-winded answer to that. So hopefully that kind of covers that. It's That's... Again, because we're family, that's my answer. It's like we have to unpack the trauma of colonization. Yeah. Maraming salamat. Thank you. Okay, we've got time for one last question. One more question. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> then I'll ask you. <laughs> I was like, oh no, of course someone else should. Um, so. Oh gosh. Uh, hi, ben. hi. Hi, Ben. Hello. Say hi to Ben. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I've been thinking about kind of your journey over the past nine years and how your story came about at a moment when so many other stories were coming out, right? Like the transgender tipping point, mm. you know, but you also came out like a couple of years after Jose Antonio Vargas came out, mm. right? And he had to come out as gay and undocumented. And I mean, the. Regardless, um, I was reading an article or a podcast or something that you were on because of your book tour, and you talked about like the relationship of your um, of your driver's license, right, and how it's tied to your identity and seeing the F. And I think about Jose and about how his identity is also tied to his inability to get an ID, right, and. Just w listening to both of you be unapologetically Filipino and talk about these things that we just talk about like amongst ourselves, right? Like Kapwa and Makapati and all these, you know, um, but to hear you talk about it in these mainstream venues that you get, um, I think is really exciting. Um, so I, I'm interested in how you process that, like how you talk about who we are to others. Yeah. Um. I, maybe, I, there was definitely a moment in my journey, when we all met during uh, 2014 when I did my TED talk and, and that, as you said, that, that moment of cultural zeitgeist of opening up about trans identity and conversation. I'd have to say this, that once I did that, once I was thrust into that conversation, an important role to play, certainly, I also felt like I, I joke about it now. I mean, I've said it so many times, but it truly, you know, in a joking you know, form, it's, it's, um, I felt like I was having an Angelina Jolie moment in my career, you know, from model to like, I'm speaking at the UN, you know, like very chic, yes. minimal, minimalist dress, you know, everybody was listening, you know. 
so eloquent, right? That. Um, after about, you know, almost two years of doing that, and the ego side, you know, that, that voice, the ego voice for that had led me there, maybe has been telling me, look at you, girl, you're trailblazing, you're doing the thing. I think I got to that realization of this burden of representation. To be the only one in the room in most of those spaces, important point, you know, to be, to speak about that, but the, the constant burden of representation took its toll in my new sort of consciousness, and I realized that it's really not a good luck, you know, where I began, yes, you're there as the only one, and then I began to question, what's the system that made me the only one, you know? And that realization is tied to the way I talk about our culture, the way I talk about the unapologetic, I mean, the things I talk about in this book, I mean, like, thank, thank you for my publisher for allowing me to say those things, you, you know. Get, you get very real. Oh, it's real, it's real, real. Um, and that's an you know, incredible, uh, kudos to, you know, my editor, my publisher, uh, to really see the beauty and the power and the importance of, of those real, real, real things that I talked about in the book. It's rooted from that. It's rooted from that realization, like, the burden of representation, you know, the expectation that the acceptable story, the respectable trans woman, you know, I, I felt like I really entered, and I, uh, honestly, the New York Times profile, um, shout out to Shane O'Neill who did that profile. It's also important that this is a queer person profiling me and saw the importance of the things that I'm talking about, uh, where I don't need to explain myself to him, you know, I think, you know, a lot of uh, journalist friends and, and friends had said, like, that I saw you in that article. Like, imagine if it's a non-queer person I'm speaking to, I would be explaining myself and my transness, you know, and the culture. Again, taking, uh, going back to that, it's rooted from that, that I can't be that respectable one, you know? I should only just speak the truth in my own version of truth. You know, and let that speak for itself. So, that's my take. Well, Gina, that's a wonderful place to start. <laughs> Stop. I mean, we've only just begun. We're just starting. You we, know, we have another hour, right? <laughs> um, I want to just thank you. Thank you all for for your participation. Anything you want? Anything else? You've already dropped so much wisdom. Anything else you want to share with us before we leave tonight? Just really thank you for being here. Um, it's. Um, this is this is my second uh, stop at the book tour. I know there's many more. But it's been, you know, the love that I've been receiving from so many people, non-Filipinos, Filipinos from from all over, from all walks of life. The messages I'm receiving, you know, keep it coming. I, I you know, I, I obviously, you know, the efforts in, in writing this book for two years and to now for it to be out in the world and to get that response from everybody, it's been, I, I truly appreciate it. So just appreciate y'all for taking your time in your life to be here so thank you go by the book that too <laughs> thank you <laughs>